Okay, so let's look at some fundamentals of uh, cryptography. So in this presentation, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some traditional ciphers. Uh, so that's the ciphers that have been used in the past, such as Caesar codes and scrambled alphabet. An important element of this and one of the ways that you can crack that type of cipher is to look at frequency analysis. And frequency analysis is all about understanding the frequency of the bytes that we see with inside our, our data. So it's an important technique and we'll have a look at how we can crack some codes using frequency analysis. Then we'll look at uh, uh, some of the fundamental areas involved in cryptography and that's the operators. So we'll especially look at something like exclusive OR, the mod operation, and also for GCD, which is the greatest common uh, denominator. So we'll see how that these fit in to encryption later on in the, in the module. Another important area is the encoding of data because we need to be, make sure that we can transmit binary data over channels which are expecting ASCII. So with this we'll look at things like B64, hexadecimal uh, and ASCII itself uh, there too. Then, uh, in, in cryptography, we typically don't deal with the small integers, 32-bit, 64-bit. We deal with very large integers, which makes the calculations quite difficult if we don't have uh, the secret key. But it becomes fairly easy if, if we, we have uh, the, the required keys. So we'll look at uh, big integers, and with big integers, we're looking at 1,000 bits, 2,000 bits, and even 4,000-bit 4, uh, 4, uh, in integer values and do some maths on them. Luckily, we have great programmer lodges called Python who can cope with these very large integers. Then an important area is to look at random numbers and to make sure that we have some randomization for the keys that we create uh, and that they can't be guessable. So we'll find there's two uh, types of random numbers. There's a pseudo, which aren't actually uh, uh, actually completely random, uh, and there's absolute random numbers too. And finally, we'll have a quick look at key-based encryption, and that will be followed up in later units. Okay, so there's an associated website that you can have a look at, which should have all the demonstrations for all the different th methods that we have. Okay, so here we are. Uh, it's our task to make sure that Bob and Alice can communicate, can store data securely, and for Eve not to get involved. So Eve shouldn't be able to listen to the communications and make sense of them. She shouldn't be able to change the communications between Bob and Alice and she shouldn't be able to spoof Bob's identity to Alice. Okay, so we get CIA, which is confidentiality, uh, that's the secrecy, integrity to make sure that the data doesn't change, and then uh, 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 availability uh, to make sure that, uh, that the data is accessible. And the thing with encryption is that the encryption itself might be uh, fairly strong, but there can be weaknesses in it. So encryption works well until it doesn't. Works great as long as no one makes a mistake. Works great unless some unless something goes wrong, and it works great as long as everything works right. Okay, so you might have the most perfect encryption scheme in the world, but if there's some flaw in there then it can compromise the whole system. So in this um, in, in, in this series of lectures, we'll introduce the concept of Trent. So Trent is trusted by both Bob and Alice uh, to be able to prove Bob's identity to Alice and vice versa. So later on, we'll look at the concept of PKI or public key infrastructure where uh, Trent can be trusted to prove uh, Bob and Alice's identity. Many of the protocols that were created initially really didn't have security 
in, in mind. So we have our network infrastructure and a lot of the the, the the original protocols for web, email, FTP and so on and DNS were insecure. So we've really moved from these older type uh, protocols from HTTP and we're now looking towards HTTPS, SSH, SFTP and so on to make sure that we secure the communications between Bob and Alice but also prove the identity of at least one side uh, to, to the other. So this involves encryption and authentication. So some of the people who created the foundation of, uh, of cryptography uh, are these people. Whitfield Diffie was uh, one person who created uh, a method, key exchange method, called the Diffie-Hellman method that we'll look at later on. But he also envisaged what was called a trapdoor function. A trapdoor function is where we can have a public and a private key and use them together. The first uh, known uh, usable uh, public key method was actually developed by Reves, Shamir and Alderman and they developed the RSA method in the late 1970s. And it's still around, but it's changed a, a great deal. And the keys that we use are much, much larger than were created initially. Still doing well, but it's really struggling to cope with some of the computation uh, that uh, we see these days. And then Ron Revest moved on and had created many ciphers, RC is Ron Cipher, RC4, RC5, RC6, RC2 and so on. He also developed hashing methods, MD5 uh, and, and so on. And Phil Zinnemann was one person who created a secure email system and more trustworthy infrastructure. For this he created PGP encryption and nearly ended up in prison because of it. We'll look at this a little bit later on in the module. Bruce Nair is one person that you should really read some of his books and he talks about cryptography in such an enlightened way and he shows how cryptography can actually build new trustworthy worlds. And these two chaps here created what was called Raindal. There was a competition by NIST <coughs> to create a new cryptography method and their method won, and it's now called AES encryption. So let's look at some typical ciphers. So ciphers have been around for a long time. Uh, we see it in quilt codes. So the quilt codes um, were used by the uh, uh, um, American uh, uh, slaves. And it, it drew a, a map of how to escape from their captivity. We see microfishes uh, that were able to take large uh, print and, and reduce them down to a small space. Smoke signals are more of an encoding method uh, because once you know the code, then it's, pos it's possible to read the signals. And the Navajo code talkers uh, created a cipher which was almost uncrackable in the Second World War. So this is a method that we can have. We can have a message, we call that uh, our plain text, and then we can convert it into an encoded format. When we encrypt, we typically call that the cipher text. And we take our encoder on one end, we convert it into our cipher text, send it over, and if Eve doesn't know what the special algorithm is, then she'll not be able to crack the cipher. On the other end, we do the reverse, and Alice is able to uh, get the plain text back again. Another uh, method that was used, more of an encoding method, uh, is uh, Morse code. So with Morse code, we'd use a dot and a dash and then a longer space in between each of the letters and between each of the words. So in this case, we have four dots. Four dots is an H that we have here. And then the E is a single dot. So in this way, we can create our 
our encoded uh, stream. This here is actually a little cipher here. I don't know if you can work out what that is, but that's an N. And there, the second one is a U. The third one is an F. And the last one is a C. This is Newcastle United Football Club here. There's actually a, a, a message on this bracelet there too. A grid code was used by Polybus and uh, we map the letters into our grid and because we have 26 letters and only 25 spaces for a 5x5 five five grid uh, two of the letters are shared but they are shared between less common letters so it should be possible for us to see whenever the letters are shared so in this case an H is a 23 and E is a 1 and a 5 and, and so on A more graphical code is the pick a pen code. So with pick pen, what we have is we draw uh, two, four grids, and one of them we put our dots in, and we draw a grid here, and we remember how to put all our characters back in. So in this case, uh, this is the square character, which is this square here, and we see that there's an, a dot in there, so that's an N. Then we have this shape here, so which is an A, and then we have this shape here with a dot, so it's a P, I, E, R, Napier. That was used as the Freemasons uh, cipher, and we can see it here on a headstone from 1792. In the First World War, uh, the uh, uh, the ADFGVX cipher was used and in this case what we do is we take our, our letters and then we map them again on, on to, to, to a grid so in this case F and a D gives us FD gives us K and so on A code developed by Charles Wheatson but made famous by Lord Playfair uses a 5x5 five five matrix with this, we lay out a secret key, so this one will change depending on the key that we use or the phrase that we use. So we lay out Napier uh, Run here, Napier Uni here, and then we lay the letters out, not including the ones that we actually included in the, the, the phrase. Okay, so there it is there and it goes right up to, to Z. Then what we do, we take two letters at a time, and an A and a T, and then we bound them by a square, and we take the letters on either end. Okay, so there's the same again, there's the A and the T, and in this case it would map to an E and an M, and so on. There's a few other rules to it, but have a look uh, on the associated website and see how it works. One of the first uh, ciphers that was created was called a Caesar code, and it was used by Caesar to send messages to uh, the troops in, in, in the field. So in this case, we move the letters by a certain number of places. So we've moved to B, C, D. We've moved the letters three places. So I've put plain text in lowercase and cipher text in uppercase. So K in this case for cipher is an H, H in this case is an E, and O is an L, L, O. It says hello. So how many ciphers do you think are possible? Well, there aren't too many, but this type of cipher was actually used by this person here, and he, he created secret messages with inside an encrypted folder, but with inside the Excel, spreadsheets, he used a basic uh, cipher, uh, Caesar cipher. So there are 25 different ciphers that we can use for this, so it's not very secure. Our more secure cipher is a scrambled alphabet cipher. So in this case, we, uh, Caesar and Cleopatra know what the, the mapping is, and Mark Antony in between doesn't actually know, or it will take him too long to be able to search for the mapping. 
in this case we have an L, which is an I, a Q, which is Q, let me find which is an N, and I think this is ink well. It's the word then. And this is a much more secure uh, cipher because there are four and 26 zeros for the number of codes that, that we have. And we calculate it by 26 because there are 26 letters that can start here. We then have 25 letters we can choose for. So for the second character, we have 25, 24, and then down to one. Or we define that as 26 factorial. And these are the number of codes. So even a supercomputer would take a long time to be able to search for the for with brute force. But the English language itself uh, doesn't have has different uh, probabilities for the letters, for two letter occurrences, three letter, and also for words. Most common letter in English is E with uh, thirteen percent. Uh, probability, the most common word is the, with 6.42%. Uh, 6 .6 so it doesn't take much to be able to crack uh, something like this by looking at the frequency analysis of the code. Okay, so what we often do is that we will take some, some text, we will then perform a frequency analysis on it, so in this case, we perform a frequency analysis and we should be able to see, hopefully, that um, the most common letter in the cipher text is an R in this case. It occurs 159 times or 11% of the time. So we can say that an E maps to an, an R. And from there, we can we can then work out uh, different probabilities and try different methodologies for for uh, converting uh, our ciphertext into into plain text. So there's another associated uh, demonstration that allows you to be able to use the online system to be able to crack this type of cipher within five minutes. A vision visionaire code is one that is used where we have again a secret word. And the secret word is then used to move uh, the, the the code mapping for the alphabet. So in this case, we have a mapping of G. If we use the word green, then an H gets mapped to an N. We then go down to an R and we map it to a V and then so on. Okay, so that takes us to the next one and then to the next one. Okay, so our cipher is then mapped, and even the same letters uh, will be possibly mapped to other letters here. Uh, unfortunately, it uh, it can be crackable by looking. If you have a long enough uh, piece of cipher text, uh, then there will be certain patterns which appear again and again. An uncrackable code is what's called a one-time pad. So with this one, we create a one-time code that we're going to use, and we find some way to pass that from Bob to Alice without Eve actually knowing it. Each time we create a new code book, and then uh, we will have to pass that code book. We might do it per day, so per day there'll be a new code book, or per hour, or for every, every time. Sometimes we could do it from a book, we could say it's from a certain book, each day the book will change. So Bob then uses uh, his random sequence uh, to be able to map the uh, map to, to the code. Okay, so in this case uh, we can take the word Shetland and we convert it into its its uh, its code and then map that to the key with inside the uh, the one-time pad. If Alice has the same code book, then she can decode the message. Another method that we can use to be able to hide the frequencies of the letters is to use what's called a homomorphic code. In this case, an E has many more codes than a V in this case. 
So we can see here the E is mapped to 25, also 26, and then to 28, and so on. By counting the probabilities of the, or by analysing the probabilities of the bytes or the, or the numbers in there, it should be possible to see the most probable uh, occurrences. Okay, so let's look at some of the encoding methods that we actually use with inside our cryptography analysis. So we start off with uh, characters, which we understand and also Alice understands, but we need to convert it into something that computers understand, which is in ones and zeros. So a common conversion is the ASCII characters, which are seven or eight bits and represented uh, on either side. So as long as as Bob and Alice are using the ASCII character codes, then they'll be able to translate those bits into characters. So an A has this bit pattern, uh, a B has this, and so on. So then what we do is we then encrypt uh, the values, and the encryption process takes the values into non-printing characters and, and can be any uh, bit sequence. So we need some way to be able to translate that back so that they are readable or transmittable uh, over the over a communication channel. So two ways to do this typically are with hexadecimal. So each byte is represented by two hex characters or by B64 where we represent the, the characters. And we translate six characters, six bits at a time to a B64 character. So hexadecimal is good because we only have to count up to 16. So after after 9, we have 10, which is A, goes up to 15, and then we have F. So all we have to do is to remember the values from 0 to 15, and we should be able to convert any bit stream into hexadecimal. So in this case, remember, you have a 1, a 2, a 4, and an 8. So this is 1, 0, this is 0, 1, 0, 1. So we have a 1 and a 4, so we have 5. So this is an E, which is an 8, a 4, and a 2, which is 14, and a 14 is E. Okay, so in this case we can translate our uh, bit stream into hexadecimal. A base 64 is, uh, is different and it takes 6 bits at a time and then converts it into a, a base 64 character. So we're taking six bits, so we'll take these six bits here. This is our stream, and then we take six bits. So this is a one, no twos, no fours, eight, and a 16. So it's a 16 and an eight, which is 24, and a one, which is 25. We look up here, and we find that 25 is a big Z. So we go through each one, and we take four uh, we'll take them in, in groups of four. So if we don't manage to fill in all of the characters, we put an equal sign in to show that there's padding to the end. So we only manage to get two characters here. And also at the end, we pad with zeros. So we would have to add four zeros onto the end here. And that's why we get the value of A uh, in, in, in there. Okay, so that shows the, the padding that we have here onto the A, and then we have for B64, we have the equal signs. So you will often identify B64 with those types of characters, but typically with the equals at the end, but it doesn't always have to have an equals them. In terms of the operators that we use, then we need operators which are fast, but also which are reversible. So OR and AND aren't reversible, but exclusive OR and rotates are. So exclusive OR, we end up with 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and it's like an adder. So the result is that, okay, a one exclusive OR, one gives a zero. So with our exclusive OR, we will take our bits and exclusive OR them together to give us that. The good thing with exclusive OR is that when we exclusive OR back with the same value that we started with, we will get the original value back again. The other way is that we create what's called a rotate. 
So the Tate looks at the, the bits, maybe 8 bits or 16 or 32 at the same, at the same time, and then we'll rotate the bits. So the bits that, that fall off the edge go back at the start again so we don't lose any of them. So we can rotate left or we can rotate uh, right. And fortunately in Python and many programming languages we only get a shift. So we need to make sure that any of the bits that fall off the end get stuffed back into the, the, the start again. Another operator that we use fairly extensively in cryptography is the mod, and that's the remainder of an integer division. So you should find the mod on your calculator, if you have a good calculator. Certainly the Windows one has it. So 143 mod 5 uh, gives us uh, 28, remainder 3. We're not interested in the, in the 28, we're only interested in the 3 there. Okay, so uh, the mod in Python is the percentage sign. I should have said the exclusive or in, uh, in Python is this symbol here. And the shift operators are those ones. Okay, and then, we, then we have different translations. We can have 8-bit ASCII, but we can also have UTF-16, which is, represents each character as a 16-bit uh, value. It can be represented as a hex value, also as an octal value, and then also as an HTML value. Along with this, we can actually define its decimal value. So it's a good idea to remember at least one. So an, a capital A is a 65 in decimal, and in hexadecimal it's a 41. Okay. If you remember that one, then you can usually remember the rest of them from there. There are some non-printable characters that you need to remember. A new line is 13. A carriage return is 10. Hex, tab 7, backspace 8. And a space is percent 20 or, or hex 20. So now let's look at prime numbers, large numbers and GCD. So in cryptography, what we want is to make it really difficult if we don't actually know the secret, but make it easy if we do. So the two ways to do this is that we can have lots of something, we can have lots of keys, so it takes a long time to try all the keys, or we could do a mathematical puzzle, which computers find difficult. So as we'll find with the uh, RSA, uh, we use the factorization of prime numbers as a difficulty. In something like AES, we make it difficult because there are too many keys to try to be able to crack the cipher. Okay, so this is a, an example of RSA. We might take uh, two prime numbers and then multiply them together. N is equal to P times Q. And if the numbers are large enough, then even though we know the value of n, it's actually very difficult to factorize back into the values of p and q. So with GCD, we will see how we use GCD a little bit later, but GCD allows us to find the, the greatest, the largest factor that, that will go into two numbers, or the greatest common denominator. So with 2 and 14, sorry, with, uh, with 42 and 56, the factors are 2 and 14, uh, so so the greatest common denominator is 14 in, in this case. Often what we need to do is to find out that two values of a GCD equal to 1, or that they don't share any common value. And then when we look at uh, the numbers that we use, the numbers that, that we have in normal programs go up to about here, 64-bit. But we use very large numbers uh, that uh, can be hundreds or thousands of bits. So there's a 2048-bit uh, integer there. And when we multiply two 2000-bit integers together, we get 4000 bits. So they're very large and it makes it difficult to make some calculations. So as we've seen before, when we have a value of 
uh, n is equal to p times q, because of the numbers that we're using, it's actually very difficult to find out the values of p and q there, because our processors aren't really optimized for for those those values. And often we use random numbers within cryptography, so we need to be able to generate a random number. The two different types are pseudo-random number generators, and they repeat after a certain amount of time. So that means they're quite predictable, and they're periodic. We shouldn't really use pseudo-random numbers in generating keys, because it might be possible to be able to guess what the random number was. A true random number generator is generated by something that is truly random, such as keystrokes or the noise from a, a, an electronic circuit. And these are the best methods to be used because it's not possible to, to guess what the, the number would be. So in game, games and lotteries and simulation, we typically use a uh, true uh, Sorry, in, in lotteries and games, we would typically use true random number of generators. But in simulation, where we want the uh, to be predictable, we will use pseudo-random numbers. We can represent them in different formats. So this is a, in a hexadecimal format, but we can also have codes such as this. And we also get a method called CRC32, which is used often in, in disk systems. And this gives us, for a certain piece of text or certain byte stream, we get a well-defined uh, signature for the, uh, the value. And if any of the values change, there's any errors, then I'll change the CRC within it. And finally, let's look at key-based encryption. So our ciphers can be broken by Eve if Eve actually knows what the encoding and decoding method. So most of the module will then now look at key-based encryption. So with key-based encryption, what we have is we have the same key which Bob and Alice share. So the challenge that we have is how does Bob and Alice get, how do they get the, the value? So we'll look at methods such as key exchange for that to actually happen. So Eve will actually know what the algorithm is that they're using, so there's no secret in that, but it will become difficult for her because she doesn't know what the key is and she must try lots of different keys to be able to work out what the the um, the key is that's been used. Okay, so there's our different methods that we have for our key-based encryption. Symmetric key encryption, we use the same key on either side, that's AES. Asymmetric encryption, we have a key pair, and where we uh, use one to encrypt and the other to decrypt, it doesn't matter which one, they will work together like that. And then we have hashing, where we only have a one way, and it shouldn't be possible for us to go back or reverse. As we'll see later in the module, it's possible through rendezvous tables or dictionary attacks to be able to reverse this process back. So the methods here are MD5, and here we have RSA and elliptic curve. So let's quickly see if we can actually calculate the number of keys that we have. So what we have is number of bits. So the bits can be a zero or a one. So let's say we make a key like this. And in this case, the key notches can exist or not. So how many keys we would be able to, to manufacture? Well, there are 16. There's one with any notches, there's one with one, and so on. Or two to the power of the number of bits or the number of notches on the, on the key. So two to the power of x, where x is the number of bits in the key. So this is the, the number of keys. Obviously, the more keys that we have, the stronger it will be and the more difficult it will be for Eve to be able to find the key, because she has more keys to check. So we go right through up to about 72. So this is roughly where we are on the internet and cracking. So anything above 72 bits is typically uh, secure. Uh, but as we'll see each year, we, we lose out uh, on another bit, roughly. But uh, anything around 120 bits and more is certainly uh, secure. But we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail. 
Okay, so those were some of the fundamentals that we have within cryptography. We're going to build on this and look at private key, hashing, public key, and so on.